It sounds like a Halloween horror story. A flesh-eating parasite, long thought dead, returns to infect beloved endangered wildlife. But it is real. The screwworm is back, the parasitic fly larva named for the long corkscrewing path it chews through living tissue. Sounds really awful. And 100 years ago, it was a pest that cost the livestock industry millions of dollars per year. But then scientists in the 1940s began an effort to eradicate them with a now common tool, millions and millions of sterile male flies. And it worked. The United States hasn't been an established population of screwworms since 1982. Haven't seen that, but now it's been spotted on half a dozen of Florida's keys. Bad news for the endangered key deer. Since late September, a crisis has been unfolding for the little deer. More than 100 have been euthanized because of untreatable screwworm infections, and they are only, well, there are only about 1,000 deer left in the entire population. So, can the key deer survive? How did the screwworm get there, get back there in the first place, and can we banish it again? That's what we're going to be talking about. Let me introduce my guests. Dr. Philip Kaufman is an associate professor of veterinary entomology at the University of Florida in uh, Gainesville, Florida. Chris Eggleston is acting manager at the National Key Deer Refuge on Big Pine Key, and all uh, an all-hands-on-deck effort to save the deer is underway. Welcome, Dr. Kaufman, and welcome, Chris, to Science Friday. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Dr. Kaufman, this sounds like a horrifying little parasite. It is. It is. And it's um, something we haven't seen in this country, as you said, in over 30 years. Uh, the The fly is um, very aggressive when it does uh, establish an infestation. And it is something we need to take seriously and, and are taking seriously. How does it, how does it, does it, does it kill the deer? Well, so an, an infestation will start wherever there's any uh, open wound is the most likely place. And so the female fly will sense that. She'll find that host, lay her eggs on it. Those eggs hatch, and the larvae begin burrowing into the animal. What makes this fly different than all the other blowflies we have is that it specifically goes after the living tissue and burrows mm -hmm. deeper and deeper. And as it burrows, it creates more of a wound. That wound draws in more flies. And when those uh, infestations get large enough or extensive enough uh, and they get to a sensitive area where maybe they uh, get into the organs or open wounds that can't be healed, uh, the animals will die. And mm. it may take 7 to 14 days. But uh, untreated, this is a very deadly condition. Chris, you're on, you're on the ground in the Keys. Why, uh, you know, what, what do you see? Do you see the, the, them being ravaged by this screwer? Yeah, well, it's been a really tragic situation down here. Um, it, this, this started back in the sort of late summer and started to get uh, progressively worse, where we started to notice uh, deer with infections, which aren't entirely uncommon. You know, they, they, they run into, we're in more of an urban area, so they run into dog situations or perhaps vehicle strikes and uh, or getting stuck in fences. And uh, so we, we'd see wounded deer and uh respond to the situation but uh, they started to show up with uh, worse and worse infections and the infections were pretty uh, well frankly kind of horrifying you know we hadn't seen uh, wounds that had uh, fly larvae in them uh, previously so as uh, when we started to really identify wow this is a problem that we haven't experienced before we took some samples sent them in and uh, then we got, we, it came back as positive for being a screw worm. And uh, from there, it, the, the mortality rate really climbed high. And there's been deer um, walking around here that, uh, you know, they're, they've got their, they're, they're still trying to keep on, but they've got large wounds on them that are being eaten. You know, they're full of hmm. uh, fly larvae and, and they're really eating the flesh. And, and it, it's really uncomfortable for the deer. And um, it's really a tragic situation for the for the community down here as well, who are all uh, you know really deeply involved with the key deer down here. Wow, sorry to hear that, uh, uh, Dr. Kaufman. Um, what's the remedy? I mean, we you got rid of them once. Can you get rid of this screw worm again? We can, uh, and it's actively being pursued at this point. So there's a, a 
a number of federal and state agencies that are working collaboratively. Uh, the, the primary method for eradication is using what's called the sterile insect technique. And in, in this method, uh, as how we eradicated them in the first place, uh, we have production facilities down in Panama where we produce these flies by the millions. Uh, the flies are irradiated when they're in the pupil stage, which sterilizes the males. Um, through that process, um, those males are then brought up and released into the environment. If they mate with a female, and, and this is where the, the process is uh, most interesting, uh, that female only mates once. And so if she mates with a sterilized male, she will not produce any viable offspring and essentially ends her genetic line. Uh, this is used in combination with, with other techniques such as trapping uh, that's used for monitoring as well as removing the flies from the environment as well as uh, people on the ground checking animals for infestations and assisting those animals to remove those maggots as well. Can, can, you, this, can you get this to work fast enough to save the remaining thousand deer? Well, there, there are other steps that are being taken as well, um, and, but this process is, is going to take about six months before they're going to be probably very sure that they've eradicated it. Now, the numbers are not going to be, they're going to progressively drop, uh, but there are other um, mm -hmm. things being done to assist the deer, such as trying to treat them uh, with medications that are going to kill any fly larvae that might um, establish on them before they get too large. Uh, and and so it's, but it is a battle, and it's something that, that is being taken very seriously, and, and a lot of people are working to, to try and save this deer. Uh, Chris, let's talk about the methods. Uh, can, can you give medicine or something to the deer? To feed them? Yeah. Can you attract, will they come over and take it? Well, yeah, it? It's, it's interesting. The key deer here are, they're known for being fairly uh, docile and used to people. And um, so there's a, a group out here, the, sort of a subset of the population that will come right up to you and uh, eat out of your hand. And that's something that we've always discouraged in the past, but right now it's kind of working in our favor in this emergency situation. So what we're doing is we're, we're luring them in and using uh, fruits and vegetables. And then when they get up close enough, we're feeding them a piece of bread with a doramectin, and that's an anti-parasitic, um, sort of part of the avermectin drug family. And, and it will move through the body, and it will work prophylactically, and it will also treat some infections very early stage. So uh, our F, we're trying to get out there and get everything treated and get them on a seven-day rotation and... Uh, that that's our that's our plan right now but we've got a whole lot of other things a, a lot of other plans that folks are working on and uh, right now this is the best one we've got for us but things are constantly changing so we may move on to something else tomorrow but like what what kind of what one. would you do besides that well I mean I, I don't know for sure that I've got the experts working on it right now mm -hmm. but it, it may be that we have to move to a topical solution if we can't get enough to to eat one of the things we've run into is, you know, there's that subset that will eat out of your hand. There's another group that will stay out about 10 or 12 feet, and then we can still throw um, baits to them or, you know, uh, the doramectin-laced uh, baits. And then there's another group that won't come anywhere near us, and they're out in the woods. And uh, so it's a real challenge trying to, uh, to treat those guys, especially when we're trying to do it on a seven-day rotation. Hmm. So... Um, for those, we may have to try a, a, a different technique. We may have to put out maybe feed blocks that have this drug in it, yeah. or maybe uh, we figure out a way to, to get this on them topically and uh, wow. keep those ones safe. And so right now what we did is we started to uh, we started at some keys down at Sugarloaf and Kudjo Key where there are some smaller populations of deer that haven't um, shown positive for screw, screw worm at this point. So we started feeding them um, this drug first. And then uh, as we got all the ones that we could get down there, we started to move up to um, Big Pine and No Name Key. And, uh, and one of the interesting parts of this is as we feed the deer, we're trying to mark them. So we, we put a little bit of non-toxic paint on them, and that will show that maybe mm. so on Tuesday it might have been yellow. So we know that we, got, we treated those on Tuesday. The next day we, we might treat with blue. So we know Wednesday is blue, so we can kind of track which deer have been treated and which haven't, and when they'll need to get their next dose. 
Um, but because there's so many deer out there that may not come to us and, and be easy to get um, squirted with paint, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that a deer without paint hasn't been treated. So that's something that we're kind of grappling with right now. Uh, Dr. Kaufman, the Florida Department of Agriculture has declared a state of emergency. There's a quarantine for the Keys, and people are, are advised to have their pets checked if they're leaving that area. Is, is that a threat to people's pets? Is it a big threat? It It is a threat, although it's uh, much less than to the wildlife, and that's really because people interact with their pets and will see that they have a wound and perhaps even notice that there might be maggots in it. Um, to date, there have been very few. Um, I think I'm aware of one dog that, that was confirmed as positive and a couple of others that were possibly uh, infested earlier. Uh, but everything else that has been found, is, as I understand it, is has been um, a wild animal. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is critical that we keep the infestation from spreading and keep it in particular off of the peninsular Florida where we have a much more diverse wildlife uh, as well as our domestic livestock. And that's why it's important that people present their animals to be inspected. Uh, this is not an instance where... Uh, it's a disease. It is not. These maggots are removed. The animal is treated and, and made better, and the animal continues. The, mm. the animals that you're hearing that are being euthanized are am animals that the infection has gotten so bad that the animal can't be rescued. And that's really not generally going to be the case for anyone that has a pet that's infested. You would see that well ahead of time. Mm. Well, uh, considering about Zika virus is such a problem in the Miami area, you don't want this coming up, as you say, to the peninsula and infecting uh, other other uh, wildlife outside of, of the Keys. I want to thank both of you for, for taking time to be with us today, and good luck in your efforts. Dr. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Dr. Philip Kaufman, yes. Associate Professor of Veterinary Entomology, University of Florida, Gainesville. Chris Eggleston, Acting Manager of the National Key Deer Refuge on Big Pine Key.